some heartbreaking stories of of I mean just in general of course the idea of of children being separated from their parents but then children being lost uh parents uh, not knowing where their their children are for a month and counting um infants it was reported by the Detroit uh, Detroit Free Press uh, an 8 month old and an 11 month old infant showing up in uh in Michigan at a uh an internment camp essentially uh, who had been separated from their parents for weeks and uh, seemingly, you know, just a, a lack of awareness of, 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 of where their parents are or where the kids are. I mean, uh, this is inevitable when you are, are, are engaged in, in, in stuff like this. And it's, it's quite possible and it seems quite likely that we're going to have some number of children who are never reunited with their parents. Uh, and this is this is horrific. And uh, so by midweek, Donald Trump apparently felt some pressure, although it's also conceivable. And I think it's important for us to at the very least entertain the notion that this was gamed out, that they knew at one point the, the pressure would become too, too great. Uh, and uh, Donald Trump uh, signs a uh, an executive order that um, essentially says that parents and children may not be separated. They would look to supersede, I should say, the Flores, Flores Settlement, which is a 1997 consent decree uh, issued that uh, prohibited the federal government from keeping children in immigration detention even if they are with their parents for more than than 20 days. And so um, this is uh, in, in holding the um, the the families together. There is, I think, some attempt by uh, the Trump administration to invite a legal challenge so that they are obligated by a court to essentially isolate and imprison these children or put them in, you know, detention or concentration uh, camps, if you will. Um, is that your sense? I mean, uh, I mean, and to what extent do you do you think that this was sort of anticipated? Well, it's, I think it's entirely possible that it was anticipated or at the very least was a plan B. You know, if if for some reason the pressure got too intense, they would fall back to this. And part of this is because look at what they did with DACA. You know, DACA, too, was a was a decision on the part of the administration to reverse uh, President Obama's executive order, which which legalized all those, you know, that 800,000 kids. Um, And but they blamed it on the court because there was a there was a case that was brought uh, that was, you know, I can't remember how many states, but there were a number of, you know, a bunch of wing nuts who brought brought a case, um, uh, you know, complaining about, you know, the complaint was that the executive order was unlawful, and that, and what they did was basically they threatened. They didn't actually bring the case. They said, if you don't reverse this executive order by August first or whatever the date was, we're going to bring this case, and then the courts are going to weigh in, and that's going to be the end of that. And and Trump very fatuously used that excuse as a reason why he had to do it. Remember, so they're full yep. of this kind of stuff. They did it with the Muslim ban too. You know, you remember the chaotic scenes in the early days of the administration where they, you know, and then they. They had a second, um, you know, executive order, and then it, it was struck down by the courts, and they kept going back and, and, and doing more. And they, they like to do that. So I think you may be right that they had this as a plan B where they could lay off the blame for this on the courts and hopefully have some lower court weigh in at some point and say, no, you know, you're violating the law, and then they could go back and say, see, you know, we, we, you know we're, we're the law and order, you know, party who's trying to do this. But, you know, again, I also think that a big part of this, and I mentioned this earlier in the program, a lot of this is to put pressure on, they think they can put pressure on the Democrats and some of the Republicans in Congress to get funding for their wall. And so that, you know, this is, they, they're moving into September. Trump, at his, at his uh, meeting with the Congress this week, 
um, basically said, you know, I'm going to shut down the government if I don't get funding for my wall. This is this is of primary importance, and he seems to believe, and I'm sure Stephen Miller is, is whispering in his ear, that this is a, the hugest political winner you can imagine, and that if he presses it, the Republicans will win in the fall, they'll be, va- you know, they'll be validated, and, and, you know, Trump will, you know, be a big hero. Um I mean, I don't know about you, but that seems like a long shot to me. I don't. That actually seems like think... a real, real long shot to me. And 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 if Stephen Miller is whispering this into Donald Trump's ear, I mean, does Stephen Miller believe this? Because no, if he doesn't, surely there's going to be a problem in December, right? I mean, it's not like this is not a testable proposition. And <laughs> I, 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 I'm serious. The, the it really does, in many respects, um, invite a reassessment of what Donald Trump thinks is in his best political interest. We, I think, you know, who assess uh, political motives and intentions and strategies, um, generally assume that the sitting president wants to retain control of Congress by his own party. And I think there is real reason to to doubt that assumption based upon the behavior, the way the Trump administration is working. And we've got to take a quick break. But when we come back, I want to I want to talk to you about that and, and talk more about the the broader political implications of of what we've seen this past week and, and what we anticipate seeing going forward. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio. We'll be right back with Heather Parton. 